Welcome to episode 12 of the Welcome Home Podcast, where we talk about the transformation from troops and boots to veterans in the civilian world. I'm Manny Wines, hailing from the great state of Wisconsin, Army Reserve, the greatest branch this United States Army has ever seen. My counterpart from the Nasty Girls, the National Guard, Dylan Sessler. How are you today, sir? From the worst uh, from, from the, the worst, worst branch that is, has ever been. <laughs> um, I'm doing great. How are you, Andy? <laughs> Here we go. You know, we're going to kick things off. It's a, a new intro. Jovial. <laughs> the new intro. Here's the deal. They wrote an intro for me one time, and uh, I'm like, eh, that doesn't sound like something I would say. And so as long as we get the episode right and the name of the podcast and both of our names, we're good. That's what yeah. people need to know. <laughs> All right. Dylan, what are we talking about today? Well, we have a guest, so I I would imagine him. I would I would hope we talk about Travis. <laughs> otherwise, Ship other, shape, otherwise see? he can be the awkward third wheel that just sits on the sideline. <laughs> yeah, you know this is uh, this is sometimes how the this is this is what I love about the military. There's all these standards and procedures, and then there's the new guy that shows up. And you're like, uh, go someone go talk to him and see what he does. We poke and we prod, and then we find <laughs> out things. All right, Travis, Travis Johnson. See, Travis, I was on his podcast recently, and uh, he had this nice bio written up, and they read it, and there's the thing. and the, We don't do that here at the Welcome Home Trash. Or Welcome Home. I was, I was about to talk about my other podcast. The Welcome Home Transformation from Troops to Boots podcast, because it's all about going through this transformation. And it can be awkward, so let's just get awkward. Travis, thanks for joining us. Why are you here today, Travis? Uh, because your production assistant made me show up. <laughs> I got all these reminders, things in my email. I couldn't get it to shut off unless I just came here, and I'm assuming that gets me off the hook. That is correct. That's Thank you. Six months, six months I've been hunting this guy down to get him on the podcast. So we all just have to I be mean, here, huh? Exactly. I wouldn't say it was a hunting doubt. It was like a random once a month, hey, man, what's up? What's going on with you? So anyways, I met I met Travis at the MIC, the Military Influencers Conference in Las Vegas, coming back. This year, they're not paying me to say it, but this year, coming back to the Military Influencers Conference at Resorts World, Las Vegas, uh, November 8 through 10, 8 through 11. All I know is I like Resorts World. I like the people at the MIC. I'll be back again this year, and that's how I met Travis. Randomly picked him up on the side of the road on our way to get Venezuelan food. That's how we do things. Navy vet, 22 years, enlisted, then officer, has a bunch of podcasts. He's the guy. He's the guy that did it right. So that's why we have him on the podcast here today to talk about what does right look like during this transformational process. So, Travis, let's start. Let's talk a little bit about your past. Where were you? Where are you at today? And what does the future hold? Uh, well, the future holds whatever we design, right? Whatever we hmm. want to create in our lives, that's what the future is going to hold, at least precursory. Uh, where have I been? What have I done? Uh, 22 years in the Navy, as you mentioned, 11 enlisted, 11 commissioned. I was an ejection seat guy. I worked on F-18s out in Naval Air Station Lemoore, California. Even got to mount a movie camera in there for the filming of Behind Enemy Lines more than 20 years ago. I've only been retired for a year, and I can't believe I'm telling military stories from 20 years ago. But apparently, that's where I am. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm old yet. I fell down in front of a group of people, and they laughed. Apparently... That means you're still young if they're running over and they're concerned. That apparently means you're old. So I'm still young, excited to be here. So, so talk about so your military service. So you and I met, and you would you started your transformation, right? How far out? What were those first steps you took so that you were successful now that you're a year removed from Uncle Sam's uh, teat, if you will? <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to make any comments uh, for or the negative that Uncle Sam does or does not have teats. But, <laughs> uh, you know, I really, when I joined, I was looking at it as a career. And I joined in my first year hitch. And at that time, got married and we had our daughter. And I was looking at, you know, what the Navy has to offer, what civilian life had to offer. And at the time, you know, we were from northern Minnesota. There's not a whole lot going on up there. A lot of gorgeous area. You're from Wisconsin. I mean, they're both uh, disgustingly beautiful. Trees everywhere, lakes everywhere, uh, just gorgeous scenery. But, man, there's just not a lot of jobs up where they are. I'm from. So I, I re-enlisted, and by the time I hit my nine-year mark, I'd already been in E6 for a couple of years, and I was looking at what the future might hold. I still didn't find any jobs anywhere. I wasn't qualified to do much of anything. All those 
ejection seat jobs that are available, you know, they are in every city and every state. Uh, wasn't a lot of opportunity. And I knew that the average for making E7 in my, my job field was pretty low. It was like 17 years before you were going to make E7. And I was sitting to myself, am I going to do 10 years without a promotion because of just the way the job that I happened to pick, you know, the way that lines up? Is that well, I'm just going to wait and I'm just going to deal with it? And I, I said, nope, I got to have some other option. I got to try to do something different. And I looked and like, at nine years, either you're going to shit or get off the pot, right? You're either going to stay or you're going to go. And mm-hmm. I still didn't have any of those options. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to look into this officer thing. I'm going to look at the Seaman to Admiral program. I'm going to look at limited duty officer. I'm going to look at OCS or OTS or whatever, O something S, depending on what service you're in, to see what I could do. And I asked a bunch of the uh, the old timers around. I said, did you ever think about this stuff? And I'm like, yeah, but I wanted to fly. And by the time I got through flight school for the enlisted side air crew school, uh, by the time I got back around to it, I was too old. Mm-hmm. And I talked to my dad. My dad was a boiler tech in the in the 70s in the bowels of the ship. Like, you didn't give those guys breaks because if they came out and saw the sun, they would be gone for two or three days before going back down in the hole uh, where <laughs> apparently they belonged. Um, he's like, if that's something you want to do, just do it and don't let anyone stop you. That's what you want to do for you and your family. Go give it a shot. And so I did. I applied for the Seaman Admiral program. I applied to the LDO program. I was taking college at the time. And come to find out, the first thing I applied for, the Seaman Admiral program, they said yes. I was just as shocked as everyone else was. Hmm. Uh, sent me to the University of Oklahoma full time, got my 40 degree, got commissioned, and then they sent me to flight school, uh, not as a pilot, but as a naval flight officer. For those not familiar, it would have been Goose in the back of the Tomcat <laughs> from so many years ago. It's the only NFO anyone anyone knows, right? Uh, that just means you're running the mission as opposed to flying the jet. And uh, went through flight school, got my got my wings, got all my certifications, combat systems officer, instructor, mission commander. I went to but my second instructor tour, and I was sitting at you know, about 15, 16 years in, and I'm like, what on earth does the future hold for me? I know I'm going to make it to retirement, barring some kind of catastrophe or scandal, I guess, that, that derails some people. Uh, I've never been much of a scandal guy. <laughs> but I knew that I had to have that future thing in mind. I enrolled to get my master's degree at the University of Oklahoma in human relations. Apparently I can now relate to humans. I guess I will let the public decide, but <laughs> I had been doing some nonprofit work uh, in Oklahoma City. I uh, did a bunch of fundraising, was on a couple of boards, ended up raising a half a million bucks in a couple of years, got that military outstanding voluntary service medal, which pained my commander to, to pin on my chest. I guess he really wasn't key on it. But uh, huh. ended up in the kingdom of Bahrain. And, you know, during this time leading up to all this stuff, I was you know, learning more about how money worked. I learned a little bit about business, thought I knew something, tried a couple of business ideas out. But when I got into the, the kingdom of Bahrain, I was like, I have got to find something productive for me to do. And yeah. I got into podcasting as a thing. Uh, it was pretty interesting. I had all the time in the world. I could read a ton of books. I read 60 books the year I was in Bahrain. Um, and started building a network. When it came down to me, I was like, what are the skills that I need? Do I need any kind of pieces of paper to back me up, and who do I need to know? And I know a lot of people that serve. Uh, I know I felt the same way coming up in my career, like networking. That just sounds like the easy way out, and or it sounds gross, right? It sounds like make your skin crawl. Uh, and yeah. the people that use networking as prospecting for their business – it is. It's an icky word. They're they're not really networking. They're just poisoning that word for everybody else. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I found a couple of mentors that really understood what net- networking was, and that's really providing value and building a relationship. Whether whether or not you make a sale is beside the point. It has more to do relationally with you know who we are as people and and caring about each other. And once I got those kind of in line and my podcast took off, we hit number four in the U.S. within three months of starting. So between the podcasting, the networking I was getting done, finishing my master's, and then we really put ourselves in the best possible financial position. Fortunately for me, I was an O3E over 20 years in Bahrain, and my family wasn't there. That means we were pulling in nearly 15 grand a month tax-free. There's not a lot of not a lot of places that allow you to do that kind of thing, uh, and we took full advantage. We pay off all our vehicles, all the debt that we had. We made sure the house was in working order, and so when I retired. Uh, a couple of years after that, we had 50 grand in the bank, and the only bill we had was our house. 
not to mention all of the other things that I built up over time. So where, when, when you, when you stepped out of that situation where, you know, you had, you, you had a pretty comfortable situation there. When did you make it uncomfortable to go to the next step where you were like, I want to try something new. And obviously now you're, you're in this situation where you're talking to two people about transformation. So where, where did the uncomfortable part start from that point on? Uh, when I really started learning about business and different principles that, I mean, none of us are taught in school, right? We're all taught to work in a factory and we use the same format mm -hmm. and simulation that everyone uses in factory work. Uh, when I was shown that there was another option and when I got a hold of that idea, I couldn't stop. And I couldn't possibly see the benefit of me staying in the military. Yeah, you get the guaranteed first and 15th. Yeah, you get uh, TRICARE covered. You get all those things. But there's all these other variables because at one point in my life, like if I didn't have that steady paycheck, I'm, I'm a foster care and trailer park kid. Like if you didn't have that steady thing coming in, like you didn't have anything. So I understood mm -hmm. what it mean that to be gifted that that uh, that paycheck. But when I learned that really at that point in my life, it was more of a cage, meaning that they were preventing me from living the life that I wanted to live. They did a great job of turning a boy into a man. They did a great job of building a foundation. But once I got to that point where I knew I had more potential than the military could offer me, I knew that wasn't the right place for me to be anymore. I even got promoted to O four and declined the promotion so I could retire. Oh. So what did you do after retirement? Well, we're just a year and one month out. My first day as a civilian was March first, twenty twenty two. And this was um this was an embattled time in my world. We found uh, the October before I was gonna retire, my wife needed brain surgery. Uh, she found a, they found a birth defect, a Chiari malformation, that basically at the top of your spine, there's a bone that you're born with that's like a gasket that holds your brain in. And she was born without that gasket. And over time, her brain kind of seeped into that, that hole that is left there, and it caused a lot of problems, put a lot of pressure on the spinal column and the spinal cord, preventing that CSF flow to flow freely, like everything that our, our body messages send and record and all the nervous system like in, it impacts everything and at the time i was in a uh, the dod skill bridge program which had me as an internship and gave me the freedom that i needed to go with her to fly out to johns hopkins in uh, in maryland and get that done uh, we had a we had it set for january we flew out there covid was still being uh, a pain in the butt with everyone's processes procedures safety concerns and she tested positive for covid so they canceled her brain surgery mm. and we're less than six weeks out for me retiring. Now, I don't know what percentage uh, that I would have had to pay for. I had to have that come out of my pocket, but I knew I didn't want to pay any percentage of brain surgery if I could get away with it. And lo and behold, we got back. We set up a new date. February 10th flew out and got the surgery done. Everything went well. She's great. I got back home and my daughter said, hey, dad, my boyfriend wants to talk to you. And he was going through school in the army down in, uh, oh, I don't know what that fort's called, down in Lawton, Oklahoma, Fort Hood. No, that's not right. Fort that's Sill? It. Fort Sill, Oklahoma? Fort Sill. It's down in Fort Sill. I knew he was finishing yeah. up, up school, and I knew that, you know, for those of you listening that don't know, the military doesn't move girlfriends. They only move dependents, right? So <laughs> I know what he was going to be asking. And then the week, uh, the week of my final, my final day in, it was, you know, March or February 28th, it's my last day in service. I'm getting ready to have this job offer, move on with my life. My daughter's getting married at the next weekend. Uh, Tuesday comes along, March 1st. My first day as a civilian, you wake up, you look around, you're like, am I supposed to be doing something? Like, you don't know exactly what to do. Uh, I got in my email that I there was a secure download for my DD-214. I got that. Next day, Wednesday, Grandma died. Or got turned 91. Thursday, Grandma died. My wife's grandmother died. Uh, Friday... My podcast course that I built got uh, approved at Forbes Business School. And then Saturday morning, my daughter got married. And Saturday evening, we had my retirement party. So we just decided to put like a whole 10 years of life which in, into one week before I got out. And 
Come to find out, the company I was going to do SkillBridge with, or I had no SkillBridge with, they offered me like seven fifty an hour for twenty hours a week, which I don't know if you all know this. That's not a lot of money. Not a lot of money. And so, uh, so, so they did SkillBridge. They did SkillBridge with you to get free labor, and then gave you minimum wage beyond yeah. that after well, twenty two years in service. Right, half of minimum, yeah. minimum wage for twenty hours, not forty hours, but twenty hours. You're right. You're right. You're right. Not even. Yeah. 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 Buying a company. Right, an acquisition, and they were supposed yeah. to go through on March 15th. So we went to the funeral in Minnesota, got back home. My my VA uh, letter was on the table. I got rated 90 permanent total, which was great to find out that quickly. And then I called my SkillBridge partner, and uh, the acquisition fell through, and the company was essentially bankrupt. So hmm. the company that I put that time, energy, and effort into for a few months, uh, they ceased to exist cease to function. So I'm with my wife, who's not working because she's recovering from brain surgery. I'm not working. I've got my letter from the VA in, but I'll, and uh, those of you that don't know yet, you they withhold your last paycheck from your active duty status. And I didn't know when that was going to kick back in. Luckily, we had the cash in the bank and we had a little bit of time. But really, as well as we were set up and as well as everything that got planned, nothing went according to plan. But fortunately, we had the money in the bank. We didn't have that many bills. Uh, we only had the house bill and utilities and whatnot. Luckily, we were in that position where we weren't forced to have me run off and get another job right away. So real quick, how, how, so you hold your last paycheck? I've never heard this before. Yeah, your last well, paycheck. Long? You don't you don't receive it because they do their final accounting to make sure Got it. All right. that so everything it's, it's, is, is the yeah. way it should be before they move okay. you over to the retired side. Yeah. Okay, and that's I mean it's pretty standard with most companies, right? You hold your last paycheck and yep. yeah, whether you, they got to, you got to turn in keys or gear, or whatever they can do to hold um hold, you know, if you hold them up, they hold you up. It's a <laughs> Yes, okay. absolutely. I mean that all yeah. I mean that all makes sense. Right. Of course, me and my household were were devastated, right? I'm not working. My wife can't work. My daughter doesn't care cuz she's off, you know, with her new husband doing stuff and then I've got a a teenage boy. So really trying to figure out what it was that we were going to do to move forward. I knew from one of the, one of the exercises that uh, you go through in business, if you talk to the right people, so like, well, what do you want your life to look like? For me being growing up in trailer parks and foster care, like I didn't know I had a choice to figure out what my life looked like. <laughs> right. But there was a whole, um, when you're a kid, the stories are pretty much written for you. Right. The first couple of chapters of the book, they're kind of there. You really don't have a choice in it. But uh, I had, oh, I haven't shared this, and Dylan doesn't know anything about me. I had two family members try to kill me when I was uh, 10 and 15. That's a, that's a fairly decent-sized uh, item to share. So we can we can talk about yeah, that when you're ready. Yeah, it's a decent-sized item to share, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the interesting thing is it was that – after the the second murder attempt, did I realize that you know no one's coming to save me and it that that's gonna happen? It's got to be up to that's me. That's a that's a pretty uh, how do you say it? Um, that's a very literal form of that uh, phrase. Uh, so can you yeah, but, can you just it can you is. just give me an understanding of of why did two family members want to kill you? Mental health problems. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, bipolar had been passed down generation to generation on the women in my family. And uh, the second time it was my mother that tried to take my life. I had brought her to the hospital after a, quite an event, and we were in another city. And we're there with her in the hospital room. They don't have medical care, mental health care overnight. So we got left alone in our room waiting for the person to come up in the morning. And uh, in the middle of the night, I woke up with my mom straddled over me with a pillow over my face trying to kill me because it was my fault that she was in the hospital because I brought her there. Wow. So how, how have you? So when the vast majority of Americans talk about their wonderful family and relationship with their mom, and that tells you a lot, the, guy, the relationship a guy has with his mom tells you a lot, it wasn't true in my case. Yeah. It's not true in cases of abuse or, or terror or a lot of other situations. Sure, it would be nice to say that that's not true, but 
in my case, it was. So how how has that kind of impacted and directed how you have moved through life? Because that's huge. I mean, that's a that's a massive thing. How old were you? Yeah, uh, fifteen. See, so, yeah, again, the same question. How, how has that impacted you? Uh, massively in a lot of ways. When you when you grow up in that kind of environment, um, that included thirty six moves, five different foster homes, uh, not having an address to call our own a couple of times, not living on the street, but definitely not living in a house or an apartment that was ours. <laughs> You realize a lot of things. You realize, one, you, you can identify more readily when people aren't being truthful with you. You can identify more readily when people intend to harm you. Yeah. Um, it's a skill that I've developed, uh, moving 36 times. That was a skill. I know how to meet people like Andy on the side of the <laughs> road at the Nick Conference in Vegas, right? Not, not weird. Yeah, not weird at all. Not weird at all. <laughs> not weird at all. So joining the military and having to move and relocate for me. That's something I had already done 36 times. That's no big deal. I know how to walk into a place. I know how to meet people. I know how to say hello. Hi, my name is Travis, or you know, make something up depending on the day. And you learn really quickly just the kind of power that, that we all possess inside as a person. The fact that I could go up to my mom, grab with a you know backpack full of stuff, and said, I'm leaving. And if you love me, you're not going to say anything about it and leave the house and move out. People have that power. They really do. Yet we hear all the time how, oh, the economy is ruining their life or whichever president is not the best for whatever reason or my neighbor is just such a pain. We have way more power in the choices that we make and what we choose to do with our lives. And I knew that I couldn't make a life for myself with um, – our name in the hometown that we were in. I had more time and more court appearances than I think anyone else that I know. That gave me the view, the structure between them and the individuals that helped us over time to let us know that it's not all that way and we can choose a better existence, a better life. I mean, it's, it's, in, it's incredible to see what you've done with it. Um, do you, do you regret any decisions or do you have connections with your mom or anything like that, that um, you've like learned from and, and understood a little bit more through going through all that? Well, there's, there's tons of lessons. There's tons of regret when I made the decision to leave and effectively save myself and myself in a better situation. I didn't take my sister with me. Mm -hmm. She was still in that environment. I don't know if I could or could not have made that choice for her. I don't know, but there definitely is that little uh, sprinkle of guilt because our lives look vastly different. She's on the, the side you might expect mm -hmm. someone with that background to be in. Well, but, well, well, uh, go ahead. <laughs> one second. but going through all that stuff, you learn a lot about yourself. Uh, I just told the story about my last week in the military, my first week of civilian life, and it was extremely difficult. I talked to a handful of my friends, uh, mentors, people I knew. I even called a, a, a buddy of mine that's another podcast host, Lauren. Um, oh, my God, what is Lauren's last name? Lauren's Michaels? Lauren Michaels. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, Lauren, if you're listening to this. I called him and told him the story. He's like, we're going to have to have you back on the show. And he brought me back on the show, and I, I told him the story. And he was like, he's looking at me, he's like, you know what? I think you're being prepared for something huge. I was like, well, what do you mean? And he's like, you know what? I bet you didn't even have to, to draw your sword to slay that dragon, did you? Mm -hmm. All those things coming at you, you didn't have to even pull out your weapon to defuse the problem. You were able to handle all those situations as they came without much of a problem, didn't you? And it's true. Yeah. I did. I didn't have to draw my sword to... to fight any of those dragons, any of those things coming at us. All of that stuff was put on there as a, I don't know what the reason was, but I know that I can survive and thrive in that kind of situation if I need to. Can I get real? Okay, I hope so. This isn't the fake podcast, is it? When you, when you say something like that, that's, again, a skill, right? And, and my curiosity is 
what happened that taught you that it would be okay? That, that, because I'm sure that I'm sure suicide at some point was a thought. I'm sure all sorts of different things were thoughts and how I, I want to know how you got through that part to get to where you deal with this last week of your, or your first week of civilian life and say, I got this. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of little things of all the things that happened to us. There was always some person, some church, some nonprofit, some group willing to help keep us sheltered, clothed and fed when my mom couldn't take care of us. There was a, a family member or a foster home that we could go to. There was court appointed guardian ad litems or, or advocates that would help us throughout the time. We would end up uh, in a, oh, I was a kid in the situation, right? So women and kids end up in like a battered woman's shelter as a place to go. Of all the darkness that I always saw, that always seemed to, to come around us, there was also light. And the light never went away. It changed intensities. It certainly changed intensities. It definitely looked bleak there for a lot of those things. But there was always the light. Um, one of the hardest times I had during my military career uh, was going through flight school. Flight school and special forces, as I understand it, have the two highest attrition rates in the military. You have to be disgustingly tough in will and spirit to get through something like SEAL training. And you have to be focused in the, when you're flying an aircraft at whatever speed, however many hundreds of knots, you have to be able to make a calm decision. And going through flight school, I got to a place where uh, in the simulators. The simulators are run by all these former uh, 05s, 06s, career guys that retired and have also been instructing for 10, 20, 30 years. And they know that wherever you're at, if you're at a 5, their job is to get you to a 7 or 8. If you're a 7, their job is to get you to a 9 or 10. If you're a 9, they're trying to push you all the time. And I had a couple of sims back to back that I did not do well on. I didn't fail, but far below my my range. I was on the balcony of my apartment building that evening before going in for my next round of, uh, you know, military sponsored butt whippings in a, <laughs> with a simulation. And, uh, I, you know, I, I, I call it to God and I was like, look, like I prayed for this. I always pray for where I am, where I need to be. And everything has brought me here. And so you're going to tell me if this is where I'm meant to be or not meant to be. Right. The next day I got, I was all prepped for my next simulator. I hopped in my motorcycle and a helmet bag on the back, right into base. And I'm there a couple of hours early because I know that I need time to prep and go through all this stuff. And I get off my motorcycle and I look back and my helmet bag is gone. I look all over I look in the saddlebags. It's not there. I hop back on the bike. I race back to the apartment looking for my helmet bag. I can't find it. I run to the apartment. I look for it. It's nowhere to be found. I get back to base and I run to the, the head simulator guy. It's like, hey, I lost all my stuff for this event today. Like, what do I need to do? He's like, go back and get all your books, get your charts back out and get prepped for today's event. And I went to all the locations I had to go to to get all those books, all those charts. I charted it out. I did the work. And right before walking into the simulator, I received a phone call. It was the base police. Someone had found my helmet bag and had the wherewithal to call it in and let me know that he had it and I could go get it after the simulator event. I walked into that vent having <laughs> not been focused, had to redo everything. I walked into that vent and crushed it. And I knew that if I was meant to do something, whatever it was, that a way would be made for me. I had to have a waiver to join the Navy. I didn't have the best criminal record right? Which is no criminal record. I didn't have that going into it. I walked into the Air Force one day and they were like, got anything more than a parking ticket? I said, yep. They said, we can't help you. I knew I didn't want to get shot at or carry my stuff everywhere I went. So I didn't look at the Army of the Marine Corps. I went in the Navy, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, the idiots went to the here. Navy and went and talked to them. And I kept my mouth shut about my criminal record until after they were bought in on getting me in. And it was no kidding, like two days before I was going to ship. And they were like, hey, we didn't have an answer for this criminal record thing. I was like, oh, yeah, that. I have one, and I'm going to need a waiver. <laughs> and, of course, the recruiter was less than pleased. All this paperwork uh, done. And 
Yeah, he yeah. didn't do his job. He didn't do his job yeah. that time. Yeah. 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 He's like, oh, right. One of those one of those gut punches. But I ended up having to do an interview with the rear admiral in charge of recruiting command, and he granted my waiver uh, after he talked to me for three minutes. So letting me get in the Navy to have a chance for me to escape my former situation. And those type of circumstances happened to me over and over and over again. I got a letter when I was, I was trying to apply for some uh, warrant officer flying program when I was enlisted in the Navy and uh, a bunch of stuff came up and I wasn't able to do it, but I received a letter from the, it was a Naval Aviation Medical Institute, NAMI. And they said, I have a letter that says, I'm not physically qualified for flight. Okay. And then a number of years later, I find myself heading to flight school and sitting in that very office that denied me years ago. And the goal when you go into that office is to get through all the stations and then to have the guy excuse you without calling you back. Like, that's the goal, right? So I go through all the stations. I'm doing all this stuff, and I'm in there in the lobby. And they call all these names. He's like, hey, if I called your name, we'll see you later. You're cleared. Have a good one. They're like... Ensign Johnson, can you come back here for a second? And I'm like, oh, oh what did they find? What is it? What is the thing? And I have this um, this coloration in my iris that's uh, clouded out. It's like white instead of brown. I've got like it's losing color. And I went back there and like, we just want to make sure that this isn't affecting you, this, that, and the other. Uh, usually when I go into an exam like this, especially an eye exam, I'll memorize like the barcode on the back of the of the uh, – computer screen or something, right? So they go, read the smallest thing you can read, and I'll rattle it off. And they're like, what is that? I'm like, it's the barcode in the back of your uh, in the back of your monitor. And they're like, oh, shit, you know, he's good. But he's <laughs> like, <laughs> it's normally what I try to do. But in this situation, I was just scared, right? What is going to happen? And he had me read all the charts and do all this stuff. And he's like, yep, you're good. And we just wanted to make sure, you know, so yeah, heart's pounding. Not sure if I'm going to be able to fly, even though I did all the things to get to that point. And the stuff happens over and over and over again where you think you are backed into a corner and there's no way out and you get let out. You think this can't happen. And before you know it, you're through it. And this has happened so many times in my life and it happens to so many other people. It's uh, are you guys um, into fast things like motorcycle riding or dirt biking or any of that stuff? I used to be. And then I, yeah, I used to be. What uh, what thing did you were you into? Motorcycles. I had a motorcycle truck when I was younger. One of the things they teach you when you're riding a motorcycle is to look to where you want to go because your body yep. will naturally follow that. Yep. When we're navigating obstacles in life, too often we get fixated on the obstacle and that's the thing that's gonna mm -hmm. prevent us from going to that next level. Sometimes the obstacle is the jerk you see in the mirror every morning yep. saying that you can't do it when it's really you telling yourself. But what if you focus on the trail, the path that leads you through, mm -hmm. you're going to be able to get through those obstacles no matter what they are. It's funny you bring that up because also with motorcycles, so I, especially when I rode, uh, I, I learned kind of on city streets, and then I would mm -hmm. go out to the country and open it up. And in the country, you catch pat, like gravel patches where it's like kind of mm -hmm. asphalt, not really, you know. And uh, I remember one of my guys ate shit. He fucking dumped his bike one time because he overcorrected. And when mm -hmm. I learned... In the city, you got potholes and stuff, right? And it's like you kind of you take it slow, but you got to use your hips, right? If you start turning, like you can tell an inexperienced person on a bike because they're using their hands a lot. It's like no, just lean into it, and, mm -hmm. the, and the bike will go. And then it's like you use your hips and your legs, and your your, your hands will follow, you know. I, yeah. But I do. It's funny you bring it up because I remember one time I I I almost biffed it. Like I was going like 110, 115. I was I was scooting, and I hit some gravel. And what it was was like you feel like you know when you're going that fast, like you start almost feels like you're floating. But whenever I was out in the country, I'd always keep my my eyes on the road, you know, three, four hundred yards in front of me because you're there in no time. And it's like, yeah, when you when you focus on what's right in front of you, you focus on every little detail. God, mm -hmm. you're gonna you're gonna eat shit. Like you're gonna go ass over tea kettle every time because you have gotta keep focus and your body naturally rotates. I love that analogy. It's I guess that's where I you know I, I I'm a business guy, right? So I talk about pro formas. I talk about um, spending money, investing in your business. And I tell people, and they're like, well, I don't have the money. I'm like, well, spend the money for the business you want, not the business you got. 
right? So if you mm-hmm. say, well, I want to spend ever 10% on advertising, don't spend 10% of advertising on what you're producing today, your revenue. Spend 10% on advertising of your goal revenue. That's how you get there. So I, I love that analogy about building in, fo- and also to your point, focusing on that. Because mm-hmm. if, if you're going to get tripped up by the pebbles in life, you, you, you know, it's, it's the adage of, you know, your your goal it has to be bigger than your obstacle, and you're, you're right. I, I mean, I wrote a book on this, and, and when you focus and give credence to the obstacles or to the self-doubt mm-hmm. or to your past, I love when you brought up, hey, I'll tell you where I, how I got here, but, and the future will hold itself. And then today it's like I'm going to do what's necessary today so that I have options in the future. Mm-hmm. You know, you were, you were, I mean, had you not got into the Navy, right, being having a little wherewithal, smart enough, right? It sounds like you had plenty of street smarts growing up as a kid, right, and using yeah. that. To get to into the Navy, because had you not get the Navy, you might have become a statistic, or you know, right? Math, math says probably, mm-hmm. you know, and you put yourself yeah. in. And, and, and again, you know, you don't need greatness; you need to be, you need good enough. And often, good enough is exactly that: good enough. Absolutely, no, I, I, I've always, uh, I've always been kind of a, a huggable guy, not very fit. <laughs> Uh, and I remember going through. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, my fluffy. Fluffy. great. Oh, fluffy sometimes. Hug, hug, huggable guy. I like <laughs> huggable guy. Yeah, huggable. I like guy. that. Uh, when I got accepted to the the Seaman Admiral program, I knew I had to go to Newport, Rhode Island, up where they train all the naval officers to do all this stuff. And before I had gone from my community, there was three people that went ahead of me that I knew. These people were top of their field. These people were smart, fit. Uh, could do just about anything, and all three of them got uh, disqualified for some reason or another. Uh, one guy went, and he wasn't able to make the grades. Another guy went, uh, and he injured himself. Another guy went, and he ended up having uh, a seizure on, like, hmm. the last day of university. So they commissioned him, and then, um, you know, you know, they retired him. He's, he's okay. But when I looked at the, the road that was ahead of me, and I saw these guys that I held in very high regard – uh, and I, I listened to their stories, and I knew that they could have done something. I don't know about the seizure, but the other two guys could have done something differently to get a different result. And the guy that went that uh, that got injured, this guy like taught himself German because he was bored. He has a master's degree, you know, before he was twenty eight. Like he ran marathons. He was in fantastic shape. He's taking care of his family, doing all the right things. But when he got to that officer training. He tried to compete with those younger guys, and that's the thing that he said that that he the thing that he messed up that he wishes he could have done better. So when I went, and one of the things I, I rarely do is I, I don't compete with people. I don't I'm not in competition with people. Not that I'm arrogant, I'm better than them or any of that stuff, but like I know who I am, and I know what I'm capable of, and I know what I can do. And I went up there. And I knew I could do sit-ups. I went over my max on sit-ups every time. Push-ups were tough for me, uh, being a short, wide, huggable guy. So I worked on push-ups all the time. And my run was probably my weakest, but I worked on it. And uh, someone caught me kind of like letting up, easing up during some of the physical activities. And they, they gave me a hard time. And I'm like, look, it doesn't matter what kind of hard time you give me. If I push myself at this point because I know my body – I'm not going to be in the best place. I'm not going to be in the best position. I might hurt myself, and I'm not willing to hurt myself to get through some training BS. Eight weeks of training, or was 13 weeks of training, something like that, for officers? I'm like, I'm not here to hurt myself. I'm here to make it through. Mm -hmm. I'm here to make it through. I'm going to do the things I need to do. It doesn't matter if at that point, for me, if you finish first or last in your class, I already had my designation. I already knew what I was going to do. I wasn't competing for one of those slots. So... I sat up with all the nukes, all the nuclear engineers, and they helped me get through the the mental part of it, right? The stuff that I didn't know. Uh, I worked out with some of the guys that I knew that were a little bit, a little bit more in shape with me and could help me through that. I worked with those guys, and I made sure to take care of my body every step of the way, and I ended up making it through where those other guys didn't for one reason or another. Well, it was I, – I mean, I hate when someone – well, for one reason or another. Well – there is reasons. You, you you said it right. You didn't have a, a a medical right thing. You you competed with yourself to make the grade on a, on a physical standpoint. I remember, yeah, to, to your point. I remember the last couple of schools I've gone to as a E six or E seven, 
and I go, and the guys that are killing themselves on the PT test, I'm like, I don't care. I'm going to stand up when I hit the 60 <laughs> points, right? Because yeah. to your point, I, I used to build max sit-ups. Like, that was my thing. I used to build max the sit-ups and the run. And so it was always good because we do push-ups first, then sit-ups, then run. This is the old Army APFT. And uh, the last couple, I'm like, I remember the one, I was like, I, I stopped at like whatever. I think it was 40 even push-ups because it was like, you know, I was at 39. And I looked and I was like, I got 40. Like I had a full conversation with the grader. Like, yep, I, I stood up. And I'm like 30 seconds into it because I, I banged him out. And I'm like, no. like, it, And at the time, my run wasn't great. Right, I, I had like 1636. I remember, you know, the army. We all the guys that Close. like been in the military, they know their mins, their maxes, right? I'm a For sure. right. I knew my I knew my max. I knew my max when I was in basic training, right? I ran I ran like 1117 when I was in basic training. 1636 is daunting when your reserve is that you know DD214 and chills on the couch. And so to that end, my goal always was exactly your point was on the physical stuff. I always wanted to pass and not get hemmed up because. I don't need a fucking PT patch. I don't need an award. I don't need licky and chewies. I need, in the Army, a 1059. That's the, whatever your uh, end of, I, I can't even think. I'll, I'll Google it real quick. But that's your course completion certificate. I need a mm-hmm. 1059 that says I did the thing. That's that's what I need. And then yep. your other point was you, you partnered up with uh, the, the individuals that were going to get you through what you needed to get through. I've, I've also seen that, too. It's like I've seen... Guys, they go to schools and they they and they, they screw around and they uh, they mess around. And it's like, well, that's a, how does that like no go there? Learn the material so you're going to be combat effective. And if that means you got to be best friends with someone that you might not be best friends in the real world, who cares? Like, find the person that's going to get you through those times. And I've also realized this is mostly true in the military. Most people that are successful at one thing love mentoring somebody else that that aren't. Like you get that classic, mm-hmm. you know geek and jock that partner up you see it in a cheesy cheese dick movie in, in the military it's true though right if you wanted if you wanted there's somebody in your unit right i don't care if you're a team a squad a squadron whatever right that is better than you at something and chances are they're willing to, to support you on it and that's actually one of the reasons why I, I reached out to you and after i met you i'm like oh you're the podcast guy and i'm like i'm when i met you we had even the the, the concept of the welcome home podcast was we were, we were farting around on some YouTube videos, and Dylan and I knew we wanted to do something together, and we didn't know what it was yet. And so I leaned in on you a little bit. I asked, hey, what, what made you successful and, and how you've been successful, and you've been very open with what you learned. And, and it's to a point where you now make your money training people how to podcast and market and get more yeah. exposure. I want to... I wanna, with respect to time, I want to hear more about that. You talked about, I know a little bit about this, but I want Dylan to know and the rest of the audience about your having an accredited course, right? Like that's an yeah, interesting. Right. I want to, I want to dig into that because I, I want to lean into the fact that you got where you're at today because of the decisions you made. And that is already something I've learned from you. And that's something that veterans often gloss over. They, they, mm-hmm. they, 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 woe is me this. And I was one of them. I was this 25 year old combat vet that was like, what the hell? Like, I, why can't I get a job? Well, because it was 2009, I had no skills, and we were in a recession. That's why. Do I want to boo-hoo some more? Or am I going to do something about it? My, my skill at the time was driving around, picking up appliances on the side of the road and scrapping them. I've now built a junk removal empire 14 years later because I chose to get my ass out of bed and do something about it. Mm-hmm. So I want to talk about what – so you started your transformation two years out. This is after all the – decisions you made to put yourself in a position to be successful. Let's talk about the last two years of your military service and or podcast accreditation. The, the, the decisions you made while you were knowing your ETS was coming up, right, turning down a promotion, all those things. Let's talk about that because that's the empowerment piece and sometimes the actual tactical steps that um, veterans, soon-to-be veterans, need to know. Oh yeah, absolutely. So uh, we'll focus largely on the on the podcasting stuff. And when I when I started learning all that business information, um, I didn't see I didn't see a future for me in the military, largely because they don't have anything that allows me to use my brain that much and mm-hmm. <laughs> have you know independent thought and bring ideas. Like I wasn't in an area that that does that. We reported to Stratcom for our mission, even though we were in the Navy. Reported to a, an Air Force major command uh which is nuclear command and control and they're not interested in innovation in that part they're interested in everyone following 
the procedures and they have big high thinkers that they pay probably uh, not enough for what they do to do those things. So they don't need that from me. So I knew that really my chosen profession at, at the time didn't have room for who I was becoming. I knew that without a doubt. Uh, when I got out to Bahrain, uh, I talked about starting the podcast, but it wasn't my idea to start one. It was a friend of mine. It was a friend of mine that actually convinced me that I needed to start one. He hid his phone. He tried to say, like, you should start a podcast. I'm like, well, how do I to start a podcast for? He's like, have you heard you? You sound amazing. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking voice. about. He actually hid his phone and convinced me to say something near him. <laughs> he recorded me without my permission. Then he played it back to me. And I was like, oh, man, that guy sounds like he knows what he's talking about. He's like, that's you, dude. That's your voice. That's what we hear. And I was like. Oh yeah, I can see why you would want me to be a podcaster. Absolutely, yeah. you know, <laughs> it was just, it's kind of funny. And I wanted to provide value back to the nonprofit world. I know all those folks helped me when I was coming up. There were so many people in those positions and places uh, to help me do something. And I knew I couldn't support just one. And I knew that I didn't know everything. And I launched the idea for the Nonprofit Architect podcast on the premise that I was going to interview leaders in the nonprofit world, leaders in the business world, consultants, anyone with the special skills to help nonprofits do it better. And I went and did a little bit of research. I listened to a few of the top 50 shows. And what I heard was basically two types of shows. I heard one show was industry people just kind of BSing with each other with maybe a minute or so of value. And then I heard a nonprofit highlight show where people would bring on nonprofits and just help them get the word out that they were doing this great thing, which is wonderful. But there was nobody teaching anyone in the nonprofit world how to do anything anywhere in the top 50. And that's what I set out to do was to educate people in the nonprofit world. Every interview I conducted, I got a little bit smarter. It's like having your own private master class with the experts that you didn't have to pay for. Mm -hmm. And within three months of launching, we hit number four in the U.S. And a lot of people ask me, well, how did you do it? How did you do it? I, I did two major things that I believe I can attribute this to. One is I got into a niche and I brought them something they weren't currently being served right. with. And two, I did what I said I was going to do. I said I was going to come out with a weekly show and that's what I did. And they could depend on me for based on what I said to show up and provide them value. How? And Do you mind if I interrupt real quick? Um, how, how much time did you actually spend researching? Like if you could total that up a couple of hours, not more than two days worth of work. Yeah. I figured, I mean, yeah. like that's like when what the people that I've talked to that are like thinking about, like, should I do this or build this or grow this or something like this is there's this, it's like two groups, right? It's, I don't actually want to research at all and I'm just going to jump in and go blind or it's, it's the people that are like, I'm going to research this for like five years and then, yeah. and then I don't know if I'll make a decision. Right. And like the people that are in between are, are us, right? Like we're like, when I encounter something, I don't know, I'm going to look it up and then I'm going to do it. Right. It's like you, there's, mm -hmm. there's this in between that people need to kind of mesh with. It doesn't, like, I, yeah. I don't, I don't think I even research my niche because I don't, I don't care. Right. Like the reason I run my podcast and this is, this is my second podcast. The reason I run my podcast mm -hmm. is I want to talk, right? Like I could care mm -hmm. less. Honestly, like I have, I have incredible followers. I have a bunch of people that listen to it, but I don't do it for them. Like I a hundred percent, I do it because I love talking to people that are, have worked through their mental health, have, have really decompressed and process that stuff and then have conversations about it. And then also for me to have a place of my own to express myself because historically throughout my life, I didn't ever give myself that. So it's kind of like my own place of safety, right? Is if it goes number four, yeah. I don't care, right? Like I could care less where the podcasts go. It's just my opportunity to talk about what I want to talk about. But some, yeah, some people like, and that wasn't my intent yeah. either. Sometimes it just happens. My intent was to provide <laughs> right. value to the space and to learn something myself. 
Um, I, you know, we raised like half a million bucks in two years doing a couple of things, but that wasn't the end all be all. When I, when I look back to the time I was growing up, when I did all those different moves and up on all these different families and all these different situations, uh, there was something that occurred that I find, I found quite interesting is that people are doing stuff. And no matter what the stuff is, you find different people doing it different ways and coming up with the same result regardless of the tactics they decided to use to get it done. But there's always this kind of like uh, bravado behind them, right? When they did the thing, I'm like, hey, why did you decide to do it this way? You know, back in the 80s and 90s, it was shut up and, you know, just just listen. Or it's my way or the highway. <laughs> or it's just this is the way I do it. This is the way I'm always going to do it. Uh, that mindset set aside, seeing different people accomplish the same thing in much different ways told me a lot. They told me that there wasn't one right or wrong way to do it. And focusing on the strategy is never going to get you there. The strategy, the information is where we're at. You can find the strategy to do damn near anything for free. It's not the knowledge that gets you there. G.I. Joe taught us this, right? The knowing is only half the battle. The other half is doing. You got to get up and do it. It doesn't matter. Oh, I know how to, you know, I don't know how to end world poverty. What are you doing about it? Well, you know, I'm still in the pre-launch phase, and I gotta go uh, talk to these people, and I really should, you know, get like get wrapped around the axle. When you start a podcast, you can make a thousand decisions and not get to the end, or you can grab a thumbnail cover art, get a host, record a show, and put it out there and see what happens. It's a lot easier to turn that car when you're moving. It's a lot harder if you're sitting still to turn that mm. vehicle, and. When I started the show, I wasn't sure what to expect. When that happened, I thought it would be a good idea for me to offer coaching consulting services for nonprofits. What I found is that nobody was interested in having me help them with their nonprofits pretty much if I was going to charge them even 10 bucks, They weren't interested <laughs> in my services. Yep. And I was getting ready to throw in the towel. I was like, well, they don't want me. You know, Maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. And then I had a mentor say, well, what do they want? And have you asked them? When I go back to my computer, I'm like, what do you guys want from me? <laughs> right? And the overwhelming <laughs> response was, Oh my God, dude, how are you doing so amazing at podcasting? We talked to you last week. You're a regular dude. And all of a sudden you're ranked in the top four in the U S like, what are you doing? You're doing something differently than everybody else is doing. Yeah. And I started to do a little research and figure out what that was that, that made me different. Didn't take more than a couple of days. I bought uh, a few things from the gurus to compare what I was doing to what they were doing. And I bought something. That was basically like six pages of bullet points saying, do this, do this, do this. But it had no why. It had no how. It had no meat to it. Um, that worked for some people. I That didn't work for me. And I wrote the ultimate complete podcast guide that was neither ultimate nor complete, but it was better than <laughs> the things that were on the yeah. market. It was better than the stuff that was out there. I made a couple of grand in like six weeks. Selling an ebook for 27 bucks, you know, and before I knew it, people were reading this stuff and they're like, dude, I can't, I need something else. I need something like a course. I sat down with somebody and I said, let's turn this book into a course. And then they went through the accreditation process because that's one of the things that they do. And as far as I know, I'm the first and only podcaster to have an accredited podcast course. I'm in three universities. You know, my clients take this information and they went from 6,000 downloads to a little over a year and a half later to 600,000 downloads. And they will tell you all day long that they accredited it to me. I just helped get them a little bit of different perspective and a little different spin on it. And then they had to do it. I'm happy to take credit for him. And I'm glad that he says, thank you so much, Travis. But there's a huge part of that that's on him because he actually had to do the work. He actually had to implement that stuff. And not everyone's going to do everything in the book, and that's totally fine. And some people want to keep it a hobby, and some want to try and turn it into a business. Some want to reach the top charts and you know uh, try to n knock Joe Rogan off his pedestal, whatever the heck that means. But when you start doing it, when you start having these conversations, you start making real connections, it's addicting. you already on your second one. I know this is Andy's second one. I'm already on my third one, looking to start a fifth one. 
Who knows? <laughs> it is just so much damn fun to connect yeah. with people, to unload, to hear a story like mine, to hear a story like Andy's. I don't know about Dylan's story. Maybe it's BS. It's not I that interesting. You. But people want the permission to share their own experience. I get people all the time that when they, they hear me share, they're like, I had no idea anyone else was going through this stuff. And as soon as they hear it, they know they're not alone. And it gives them permission to share their story. My getting out of the military story was a disaster, but it would have been way worse if I wasn't set up for it financially. Yeah. It just reminds me of Gary, Gary V quote I put up on my uh, Facebook wall a couple days ago. Uh, do it for the process, not the prizes, and your life will become so much better. Mm-hmm. The, the whole reason we got here today, Dylan and I, we met like 15 months ago at a, a networking event. And it was that standard, uh, hey, you two guys are veterans. You should stand next to each other and we should be talk. friends. And I'm like, all right, I, I'm used to being the only tall guy with a camo hat on in a room. So I'm like, fuck yep. this guy. He's, I, I, don't, I don't have competition. I got collaboration. I'm like, hey, man, let's go get lunch. Let's go figure this out, right? And I was like, hey, this is something I like talking to. How do, how do I how do I get to talk to you more? Right? And it was a couple different yeah. iterations. We did some TikTok stuff, some YouTube stuff. And then our, 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 our smart guys that post things are like, there's a lot of veterans that watch your stuff. And I'm like, cool. Like, we were avoiding the veteran angle because we're like, oh, we yeah. don't want to be just two guys doing veteran stuff. And then it was like, well, that's actually the good stuff. Right? Like, we, 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 we try to manufacture something that wasn't there, similar to what you're saying about you know, trying to sell consulting services to nonprofits, which is a – zero sum game and i know that because i also <laughs> did that right i actually gave my information for free i was a, a mentor coach and they still didn't listen to me even when it was free and i put the time in they're like well that's not the way we do things right um but and, and, and the point is when you love the process like hey when i spent an hour hour and a half on monday at 5 p.m i gotta hang out with dylan and another veteran or veteran you know supporting individual it's like well that's interesting Right. And, and you learn along the way. And then what happens when the podcast happens, right? And, and yeah, if, if I wanted to make a career out of it, I'll put in the work. And if I want it to be a hobby, I'll put in the work. The challenge is the people, veterans and civilians alike, that have a disconnect. They want one mm-hmm. thing and they're not willing to put in the work. It's really that simple. Yeah. Well, and they don't really want it then, right? They, 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 want, well, they want the end state or they want what comes with the end state. They want the fame. They don't want to put in the work and also risk having a hundred doors slam in your face. And after the first hundred, there's going to be a hundred more. Like mm-hmm. that's the reality of it. The, yeah. There's no such thing as overnight success. You know, there's not people that fall into luck. It's no people put in the work yeah. and, and, and you, you, you know, you swing in enough pitches, you're eventually going to hit something. They, they put the right work into the right areas. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm great on too. camera. I'm great talking to people. I'm great in front of a crowd. Great hosting the Veteran Podcast Awards. I'm great doing that stuff. What I am not good at is a lot of shit. A, basketball. I'm short. I'm wide. Not my sport. Uh, <laughs> two is I'm not a tech guy. I have enough yeah. tech to make sure my life isn't completely just waiting for everyone to do every little thing. But I'm not doing this stuff. I built a team that does all of these things. They've been trained with me in mind and the things that we do in mind so they can provide the products that are needed to help people mm-hmm. in business do what they had to do. All of that stuff and knowing where your things are. When I we'll go back to the uh, that week that I, I, I got out of the military, I retired. I was going through something and I had someone say to me, I want you to take everything in your schedule and I want you to write on a piece of paper or however you want to annotate it, everything that's on your calendar as it comes up, how you feel about it, and then how you feel after and it was basically a plus minus system. Did it give you energy or did it drain you? What are those things? Yep. And there was a lot of things that I was doing that had kind of an altruism effect. They were good things, but boy, did they leave me drained. And when I looked at the evidence of how I actually felt after everything that was on the list, there was a lot of things that had the negative sign by them. And those things I offloaded either I can delegate it, eliminate it, automate it, or just quit it all together. If it's something that needed to get done, I knew it wasn't going to be by me. I was never going to get anywhere if I was the one doing the stuff that I hated. Yeah. Can I can I build a, a website on WordPress? I can. Man, is it going to be a process yeah. for me? I can do it. How much time is it going to take? Man, I can't even so tell I feel you. about accounting. Why not find the person 
that when I give them the prompt on what to do, they can do in 30 seconds with no effort. Yep. Why am I going to, like, bang my head against the wall to try to get this thing done? I don't need to know the how. I need to know the who. I need to know if we can do it or not do it, if we need to do it, and how that needs to look. And the sooner I start in offloading things that were draining my energy, either to keep them in my team and have someone else do them or to get rid of them all together, that's when everything started opening up for me. My schedule in a week? I don't know if it's even 10 hours that I have scheduled for myself. And I'm not saying that to be like, oh, man, those guys got it figured out. I know the things that I have to do, the core work that I need to do as a person running the business. And I do those things. And everything that doesn't have to be me, I don't do. I can't possibly do it. I know where my strengths lie. And it's not sitting on a laptop behind the scenes. That's not one of my things. Oh, that's it's it's great self awareness and and also self regulation. Mm-hmm. I, I hate the term self control. So it's something we use a lot in society. Self control, and I hate that because it's like, well, I don't want to control myself. However, I can regulate my energy and my time and where that goes, and that's it's much more empowering, right? And then through what you call self reflection, right? If I look at this, is it a plus minus? And it, it, it can be that simple of a system. I love everything you're talking about because it's simple and it's binary and it's trackable and it's measurable. Like I love the numbers of things because mm-hmm. I, I can put people's emotions in numbers when you ask the right questions. And then and mm-hmm. then it becomes more clear because emotions or, or energy, it's not a very clear thing, right? However, you can develop a, a clear process to evaluate. And then to your point, you know, if you can put the best 10 hours of your week you know, into your business instead of spending 60, 70, 80 hours, right? I used to, just like a lot of people thought it was a badge of honor that I worked 80, 90 hours a week, right? And there's people out there online that talk about the grind, the grind, the grind. And I love the hustle, the struggle, the grind. Mm-hmm. But I, and I choose when I grind. And now when I grind, I go hard. You know, when I, yeah. when I, I do five to six hours of content every Monday because I'm fresh, I can tell you this is the last piece of content I do every Monday typically, and I am emotionally drained afterwards, and I'm also satisfied. Like, my Mondays are quiet because it's like Monday I come in, and Monday morning I'm kicking ass at work, and by the afternoon I'm doing my content. I am drained and satisfied on Monday nights, and it's like I'm not ready to have another content conversation. Shooting videos, podcasts, nope. I need to work and grind for four or five days to get my brain reset. And that's yep. that's a beautiful thing, right? I, I love what you're talking about. Hey, these are the things that only I can do. There's that list of things that only you can do. And that's it's something else. When we think about that transformation you go through as a military member, you have that choice. In the mm-hmm. military, you have to do all the things, right? Here's your yep. rank. Here's your duty position. Here's your areas of assignment. And you have to do it all. Here's the magical thing about the civilian world. You have this magical thing called choice. (laughs) You get to choose where you put your energy. You get to choose where you live. You get to choose where you're going to be around. And that is daunting for some people. You got to practice. Like you said, you got, you, you practice walking around. My name is Travis. This is new. This is weird. It's fine. I got a lot of practice. You Mm -hmm. have to practice all those skills that you're going to need when you hit the real world including what you said and as we start wrapping up the show i wrote this down i, I got my i have a i finally put my a pen a pen and a <laughs> pad of paper at my desk because otherwise it was always chicken scratch yeah you go or i was pulling stuff out of my recycling bin and what you said i absolutely love um i'm gonna have you on my other podcast because it's the trash talk business podcast and and we can talk business on it junkable mm-hmm. theme it, it, but it, and it's business. But this is what you said, and this is what I, I, I am a preacher of this. I, I, I developed a system called the six buckets of business. You, and people have skill and will to have a top three buckets and bottom three buckets, right? It's all in line with what you said. And so this is my top takeaway, and then we'll go to you, Travis, for your top takeaway. Top takeaway that you said, and it's a, it's a rhyming scheme, which I love even more. Delegate, automate, eliminate. That is the key. Because people say, well, I can't stop doing this. Well, Yes, you can. What can you do? You can eliminate the things that don't serve you. You can delegate the things that have to get done and someone else can be trained to do it. And you can automate the things that need to happen without your control. And you don't, right, whatever that process is. So I love that. That was my top takeaway. And that applies in business and also in life. Because when you have choices, you choose what to delegate, automate, and eliminate. You don't have to be all things to all people. 
Travis, top takeaway from the day. Uh, top takeaway from the day, and this is not something that, that I got into. Uh, I, sometimes I get into this like early on in the conversation, but this doesn't just apply to the work that needs to be done. This applies to the people in your life. Uh, mm. I think Dylan asked me if I had a relationship with my mom, which I didn't really answer. I have a relationship with my mom because she took responsibility for what happened. She works every day to try to make sure she's the most mentally well she can be. And no, not every day is going to be the same, but she recognizes and takes steps to try to make it the best she can be. Is it always wonderful? It's not. Uh, the other person in my life, I don't have contact with. They have never once taken responsibility for anything in their life. It's always the other person. It's always some situation. It's always... Just the stock market, it's the weather, it's the president, it's the neighbor, it's the, man, good luck getting the rest of the world to go see a therapist to fix your problems. Good luck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, what? at the end of the day, regardless of how much DNA we share, that doesn't dictate someone's right to treat you a certain kind of way. And mm -hmm. she will never be allowed in my life again. And the only chance she might have if she shows up with, I'm sorry, it's my fault, Yeah. right? No matter how much DNA we show, like, oh, I can't do that. It's been my best friend since high school. Your best friend since high school has been treating you like shit for a long time, treating you like a doormat, don't care about you in the slightest. Because as soon as you put up your boundaries, the problem with being nice is not that we're being nice for other people. The problem is, is we're not being nice to ourselves with first and in equal mm -hmm. measure as we right. give it out. That's how people become drained. That's how people become doormats. That's how people lose their self-worth is by not being nice to themselves first. So please, anyone listening to this, Andy, Dylan, whatever you, situation you have going on in your life, you dictate by what you allow. You train people how they can treat you. And the first time, if you don't say anything, they may not notice. They may not even know that they've done anything wrong. The second time, they understand that. You're perfectly okay with whatever is happening. And if you're not, well, then you haven't said so. And yep. I know some people have a hard time being as direct as they need to be, but sometimes you have to say, and thus is enough. No, that's good. It's, it's another thing that we as military often suck it up buttercup as the yep. answer. But in actuality, mm -hmm. you get the opportunity now to set your own boundaries and hold the people in, and, and yourself accountable for those boundaries. You, you have the opportunity to walk away. Dylan, top takeaway. Uh, you discussed it earlier, but I, I love the the idea of there is no right and wrong. It's it's how you perceive the, the situation, the circumstances. It's how you perceive anything. Uh, and, and delivering the understanding that when there is no right and wrong, you start to be more tactical about how you approach what is actually happening. You start to be more regulated and all the things that you were talking about, right? You, you start eliminating things that, uh, that it may not, you know, it may be, I enjoy it, but it's also taking away from me. Right. And so you, you stop favoriting things that are, uh, essentially taking away from your life. And you start to realize that it, this isn't about right and wrong. This isn't about good and bad. This is about what do I want and what am I going to get? And if this is in my way, I'm not going to get what I want. Right. And, and I love that. I love that it's, it's not so uh, confusing or complicated or um, disconnected from what we're actually trying to achieve. It's something that is, hey, you don't have to look at things as this binary right or wrong, good or bad kind of mentality and assume that just because it affects you means it's bad or whatever. It, it can be something that is gray and essential, unessential, you can make it a different kind of binary. And I, I just love that you're, uh, you know, obviously your life has taught you that, but I, I love that you uh, mm -hmm. discuss it and, and, and really understand that. I love that. I, I really appreciate that, Dylan. There's, there's something that's been coming up for me in the last couple of months that I've said a couple of times, and I really feel like it applies here. Too many times do we find ourselves in situations where we're putting energy and emotion into a thing yeah. like whatever the thing is. I got, I got a pair of uh, sunglasses here that I wear frequently. And some people know me for these yellow shades. They can say something like, I hate those shades. 
why on earth are they putting their emotion, especially a bad yeah. emotion, into an object? Yeah. We're, we're putting emotion into these things in our lives that don't have anything to do with anything. Man, I really hate the governor. I really hate the, the governor doesn't know you in the slightest. <laughs> and even if they do, they probably don't think about you. Why are you putting your energy? It's not, it's not about emotion. It's not about right or wrong. It's about that plus and minus is energy management. Simple. Right? People are like, oh, I can't believe what's on the news, man. Every day this, every day is that. You love the news. You know how I know? Because you keep right. watching it. And you love that it makes you feel that way. Yep. Don't pretend yep. that it doesn't. You're maybe not happy with the result, but you keep going back because of the feeling yep. you get. You're putting feeling into the news. I know we've got gun control topics because of the mass shooting in, in Nashville. I want to know how that person got in the building. Because in Oklahoma, you've got to ring a bell. You've got to show your ID to get in because the doors are locked. And the first yep. person you meet when you get in is an armed officer. Yeah. It's not about the well, gun. So much more well, than the gun. Well, we won't we won't jump into that. That'll be for another episode. So <laughs> I we'll bet you won't. Way, <laughs> yeah, we'll get we'll get too twitchy too soon. Uh, I'm Andy. He's Dylan. Travis, appreciate it. I appreciate how vulnerable you were, your insight, and and for those uh, individuals that are transforming from uh, troops and boots to veterans of the civilian world or family members that want to support veterans, you've come to the right place. If you haven't heard it lately, welcome home.